Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Slow Flowers Show with Deborah Prinzing, episode 517. This is the weekly show about slow flowers and the people who grow and design with them. It's all about making a conscious choice, and I invite you to join the conversation and the creative community as we discuss the vital topics of saving our domestic flower farms and supporting a floral industry that relies on a safe, seasonal, and local supply of flowers and foliage. This show is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 880 florists, shops, and studios who design with local, seasonal, and sustainable flowers, and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. As I mentioned last week, in celebration of our Slow Flowers podcast's eighth anniversary, we launched our new live stream video format. We're calling it the Slow Flowers Show with the goal of sharing the faces and voices of our members, as well as tours of their farms, their shops and studios, and most of all, their flowers. I'll share our sponsor thank yous at the end of today's episode, so let's jump right in and get started. Today's guest is Deanna Kitchen, flower farmer based in Mount Vernon in the Skagit Valley, north of Seattle, Washington, where so much great agriculture, especially floral agriculture, is rooted. Deanna and her family grow flowers, livestock, and three sons at Twig and Vine Farm, a 10-acre micro farm with just under one quarter acre cultivated in flowers. As Deanna writes on the farm's website, dahlias are the reigning queen here, but we also love to grow unique foliages, vines, and whimsical bits like grasses and pots. I visited Twig and Vine last week to film a video farm tour with Deanna. Join us as she harvests stems and discusses some of her favorite field crops. I asked Deanna to share her story and the conversation naturally turned to her floral passion and mission, the Growing Kindness Project. Now established as a nonprofit 501c3 organization, the motivation behind her endeavor is a campaign of kindness that becomes a ripple of goodwill reaching across the world. Deanna likes to quote the late Anne Frank, no one has ever become poor by giving. The Growing Kindness Project is working to support anyone who wants to share kindness by growing and giving flowers. It provides support, education, and resources to help participants grow and give flowers, whether they are experienced gardeners or have never planted a single seed, whether they tend to a pot of flowers on a city balcony or produce acres of blooms on a farm. Deanna and her team of Growing Kindness Ambassadors are motivated to help anyone grow kindness in their communities. So thanks for joining our conversation, originally recorded on July 22nd. It was a windy day, and I apologize that we had a lot of related audio challenges. But Deanna was a great host, and I am so grateful she was able to set aside time for me to visit and capture a slice of her world along with her beautiful story. Let's jump right in and meet Deanna Kitchen of Twig and Vine, and the Growing Kindness Project. Okay, we're back to recording. Tell me about your sweet peas. I love the trellising. It's just like... Yeah, this was a fun... You know, sweet peas for us haven't been... Like I said, we really grow minimally for market. Um, you and I were discussing earlier that this farm has really been a journey about figuring out what piece the flowers play. And it took a few years and still learning and realizing that the flowers are kind of a piece of the farm puzzle for us, but they're not the whole pie. Um, really what our hope and dream was to, is to cultivate a farm where people feel welcome and where it's beautiful and restful and we could invite people into that with us, um, which is why we've leaned a little bit more into workshops and events, which obviously with the last two years, that's been really um, tough and odd. Changed. Too. Yes, <laughs> right? but... You know, eventually um, we'll be back in a, you know, a, a real rhythm with that. But um, great. Let's, really awesome. let's harvest a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. I was going to say for the sweet peas, um, they, they really have been about just what I love them. I enjoy them, but it's not like it's a cash crop for us. Um, you know, we tuck them in here and there with subscriptions or bouquet orders, but um, it's really just been about what's joyful for us here on the farm. that looks beautiful. And so those were, we had a dead tree that fell salvaged what we have. I think it's Arthur Ashe says, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. 
And that's been a very favorite um, guiding philosophy uh, of mine. That's and a great philosophy. philosophy. So you're going to cut a little bit, and um, then we're going to talk about um, what you're what you are doing to. Well, you have two facets of your business. When we sit down, we'll maybe talk more about yes. uh, your new newish project. But uh, Twig and Vine, did it start out as a mainly CSA business or? Yeah, it, we have taken on all kinds of variations. Um, when I very first started, my kids were really little. I'm just put down this way. Um, the kids were really little. I had actually just designed my teaching position and staying at home with um staying at home with a toddler and a very newborn and just really felt like I wanted something to do that was creative and an outlet in that in that way and thought to had some aspirations that we would be able to supplement income with that with a side business as well and sort of but that's that's come to fruition in lots of different ways. I can share more about that later. But and Deanna, you were at a different property anyway at that time, right? Yes, we were on just an acre. Okay. And so what started out, how I started out was just um, thinking I wanted to be a wedding designer, which is funny now that I'm farther along. I think just, you know, age and maturity, you can see yourself with greater clarity, but also recognizing that was not the best fit for me um, in terms of, just the strengths that it needed and what I brought to the table. So really, really quickly learned that as a family, it did not fit our lifestyle. Um, really quickly learned that we weren't ready to sacrifice our only family time together on the weekends right. for events. And it just, it was, we were in a season of life when inevitably like someone would have an ear infection or be up all night, you know, the night that I was trying to work on a wedding. And so, um, slowly kind of started shifting from that, and I tried a um, roadside stand because we were a little closer into town like we were talking about. So I started growing flowers and selling them on our roadside stand, very small scale, and that was really joyful, and it was a good fit for us the age the kids were. And it was about that time that we started looking for um, more property and looking for a farm. We've been both raised um in really rural areas with lots of room to run. And we really wanted that for our kids. So that's how we ended up finding this farm. And that was kind of just, I would say I was just a couple years into my flower journey then. So I thought for sure that the thing to do, it's been a lot of learning that, well, what everybody else is doing isn't necessarily the thing that you should be doing. So I thought, well, I really like I like this small, you know, this scale of growing flower or this process of growing flowers and selling them. I should go to market. That would be a good fit for me. Um, and again, that was a process of learning like that wasn't really tapping into what not my natural strengths were and what brought us joy. Um, so the first few years on the farm, we did um, subscriptions and then um, um, some like retail sales or wholesale sales with florists and some retail sales with pop-up shops in town, um, but kind of also really started realizing what was really joyful was the bringing people together around flowers and leaning into that. So I'd always kind of wondered, you know, having been a teacher, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? Mm. This You're thing right. that I feel naturally proficient at, but not necessarily the thing I want to keep doing as a career. Um, so it was the first winter that we were here on the farm. You and I were just talking about, um, I was sharing that moving to this farm. This is actually our fifth year. Last week was our fifth anniversary of moving here. And we forget how far it's come because we can only see the projects that we still have to do. But we, um, we moved in with 1986 double wide. I was just sharing with you, there was a pothole so big in the driveway that you literally would like almost get lost in it driving here. <laughs> um, it was very, it had been a rental for 10 years and everything that you see here had been sinkholes from, we had um, cedar stumps that had been pulled and removed and then the, the ground um, settled around. Uh, it was black and we were infested with blackberries morning glory thistles it just there was a lot to do um and yet there was also this tremendous freedom because we'd moved from this um 
what felt like a picture perfect, you know, craftsman home that we painstakingly renovated, you know, and a yard with truly, literally white picket fence and cottage garden. So to let go of that and move here, it almost felt like this like fearless launch into just showing up as we were um, and inviting people into that alongside of us. And so the very first winter we were here, um, we hosted a uh, wreath workshop. And in the wreath workshop, um, nobody said anything, you know, about the messes or any of those things. Nobody noticed that. Everyone was just so joyful to gather and create together. And it was a huge aha moment for me that this is what I want to be doing, is gathering people around for these, like, really joyful experiences. And so that's really the way the farm has shifted. But along the way, um, I should probably walk and harvest something else. Well, this was a Monarda you just uh, harvested, right? Yes. This one is lemon mint. And lemon mint. It's such a pretty color. I love, this is one of my Sure. It's kind of a blender too because if you cut it early, you're getting a lighter, oh, totally. a lighter tone. Or is that totally. the older? No, this is the younger, and then uh -huh. it, it matures. Like some of these are little past prime. That's okay for what I'm going to do. Yeah, what I'm going to do with them today. But yeah, these guys when they're like this, it's like ombre. Um, right. As right. it comes up, and then we actually had I can't remember what variety this is. This is done now. Well, this, it might. I shouldn't say it's done. I need to check. But this guy, it was a darker you, purple. You've harvested most of yes. it, though. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Make Great. I'll there. follow you to the next patch. So you, this area that we're in, um, you said it was had been like tree, there were tree stumps and that yeah, sort of thing. So we're up on the hill. I know a lot of people here are like, oh, it's Desert Valley. You're like in the famous, you know, tulips and fertile soil. And we have like some of the best soil anywhere and we do in the valley but we're right up on the hill so we're up where we're at had been wooded until I, it's not been that long that this i drove by a field with tons of tree stumps on my yep, way here yeah so that that actually just was cleared last year so this and that's what our property was I, it's more than 50 years ago we believe but um so yeah it had been all wooded so typically what they do is um pull the stumps and then usually they get like slash burned or piled. Well, some of our stumps were pulled, which um, leaves you with settling. So we have really uneven property. Like some, there's one section of the property that we have not yet regraded. And that, I mean, it's just roller coaster. And then the really challenging thing was we had areas where they buried the stumps. And so the stumps over time had rotted down. Oh my gosh. So we had sinkholes. Right. So some of them, like, we actually take it, like, really long, you know, sticks down to try to figure out and could not find how deep. So we had areas of the farm that were off limits for the kids that first summer. Yeah. Um, so the first process of even, like, recapturing this is, like, you know, arable land. Agriculture, was, yeah. Yeah, was to pull the stumps. Um, so luckily... Um, my husband actually works in civil engineering and has access to um, heavy equipment and experience with moving dirt. <laughs> and so that was that was what made this property a good fit for us. So we spent the first summer just pulling stumps. Um, the, the soil was so heavy and compacted and clay, so much clay, so much rock that the first year in order to even get going with planting anything, we actually trucked in soil mm. um, and mm -hmm. created raised beds in the area. I'll show you in a minute. Right. Um, I saw that. Vegetable garden. Okay. And then this is all, almost all cut flower production. And what air, How? What square footage would you say this is? Oh, my lands. I should know. There's like that. 20 rows. I think we have 17 rows okay. that are um, 4 by 50. Okay. So that kind of gives it good. And we, like I said, we keep scaling back. I actually had... <laughs> To, I had more rows in that area now that's un, all under under progress for the next project. Um, but it, uh, yeah, definitely. It looks like there's about half are devoted to dahlias and the other half are devoted to yes. um, yeah, herbs have, and, and... Yeah, so we have some perennials. I'm really mm -hmm. trying to up my perennial game. Um, one, because I really enjoy it. Two, because it makes a lot of sense for the kind of work that we want to do with flowers and also building that the farm being a beautiful place right um but yeah right now that's kind of what's carried us is um in terms of the farm like having um 
financial stability. So we have $600 in the ground this year. We had about 800 by the end of the season last year. Um, did you let them winter over in the ground? No, nope. we okay. didn't. You we dug pull. them. We actually get really, get really, really damp soil. So I try to get them out just as soon as we get that first good window after frost. So, yes, yeah, so we have 600 in the ground this year. Um, and uh, most of, like like I said, the farm's like financial stability comes from a tuber sale. Um, oh. This last few years, especially with not being able to host any events. Right. So with everything shifting, being online the last two years, the tuber sale was a great way to just float the farm because we could do it. You know, you could ship. So. Is that why you went down from uh, 800 to 600? Uh, no, that was really more just that piece of recognizing, number one, that I couldn't keep up with everything I had growing. Mm -hmm. And I either could scale up and hire employees and go bigger and sell more flowers. Or I could scale down and make it fit our lifestyle. Yeah. And so it's just been a process of scaling down and making it fit our lifestyle. And I wish I could have, um, I guess, given myself permission or told myself 10 years ago when the kids were really little. There's always in the back of my head was this, um, I don't know, uh, idea that like, okay, when they're out of diapers or when they're sleeping through the night or when they're school age or when they can you know fix their own peanut butter jelly sandwich like things are going to suddenly free up and there's going to be all this time and space and there is absolutely you know a different rhythm um as your kids get older but one of the things that i didn't recognize i think is just a parenting as a bigger you know picture is that they still the, the emotional intensity of them needing you and the busyness of needing to run them to this event to that thing or you know to meet this friend Right. Um, doesn't go away. And I didn't want the farm to overshadow that. And so that's why we've been just kind of constantly in this process still of refining and resizing until it fits what yeah. feels right for our family yeah. in the season we're in. That's so, good. Yeah. Um, you're cutting some really interesting oregano, I think, yes. right? Yes. This is wild marjoram. And this, so it has a really long stem. This I inherited from a friend to start years ago. This is such a great standby in the garden. I love, adore this one. I did not get it netted. Again, this is like show up as you are. This would do best netted, um, but it is awesome right now. You can harvest it as a filler um, or harvest it right now as dried mm -hmm. or earlier in the season. It makes a really beautiful just foliage filler. Mm -hmm. um, so I love, I love that, that, that usability in all, right. in all stages. But it's it's perennialized, right? It, it is. So it you is. could net it next year and Absolutely. get yep. longer stems or yep. something. Totally, yeah, totally. And I think, I mean, like even then, like I mean, if I actually cut down to the bottom plant, I mean, like that's that's average stem length. Unnetted. That's crazy. Yep. And yeah. you can grow this one from seed, but it really, um, it's really really um, prolific. So it's also really easy. I actually just dig and divide. I'll just dig and divide my plants and you know split them into clumps and move over and take a little more space with it. Mm. But again, Neat. last year I actually downsized because I had double the size of this row and it was more than we needed. So instead, well, of, you probably had somebody who was happy to take your extra clump. I did. I did. So okay. Wow. Okay. I don't know. You have to. Oh, I'm like still. You, I'm, you're gonna be able to cut and stuff, right? I'm okay. having fun following okay. you. Yeah. I'm so glad, and I'm hopeful that I'm on the right track sharing the things. Oh, it's wonderful. I'm yeah. Doing. All right, I am gonna hop the row. This is what I always tell my kids: don't hop the row. <laughs> don't do what I do. <laughs> Well, you're kind of a one-woman show, too, because I'm sure your husband and kids help, but this is really... It, they're, they're tremendously helpful. There's lots of parts that they love. You know, if it's on a, if it's on a machine, they are happy to jump in and help. Um, if it's weeding, not so much. <laughs> but they have a lot of their own um, endeavors and responsibilities on the farm now. And so as they've gotten older, their interests and responsibilities on the farm have been much more focused on the animals. Um, yeah. So they do really all the animal care. I don't really have daily responsibilities with the animals. So I spent a big, very good time with it. So this year, Deanna, do you have CSA customers? I do. We have a very small amount. Again, it was that choosing uh, less but better yeah. for our family this summer. 
Um, so we have a small CSA bunch that's just getting started next week. Actually, I really didn't want to gamble um, with with pondering what was going to be in bloom in this mid. We don't have a lot of next year. I'd like to plant more biennials, but we didn't have a lot of that. The earlier stuff. Yeah, to really um, sustain us in that June window. Um, and we didn't run spring subscriptions this year. I think I may next year. Um, so yeah, they kick off next week. So we have a bouquet subscription. And then a few weeks after that, we have our Dahlia subscription kicking off. Just, just bunches just of dahlias, bunches of dahlias, which yeah. makes it easy. There's not a lot of production on that, right? Yes, totally. And that was really my goal. How can we, you know, again, what, what makes sense for what we're doing and how much we have. And so it's just been this constant refining process. And um, we are really, really lucky. We partner with an incredible um, little bistro in town and they're a pickup site for our subscriptions, which honestly, to me, I love getting to put flowers in people's hands, but it's the connections that I really, really love most. And so, uh, you know, every week getting to pop in and see the lovely ladies down there and share, and we always share flowers with them. You know, mm -hmm. it's sure. It's been, it's been uh, a highlight for me. So do you do one delivery day a week? Um, yes. Uh -huh. So we do Fridays. The 10 people just seem to be like, Friday mornings, they, at least that's what's worked in our community. Mm -hmm. Usually they're gearing up for the weekend and they want them for, you know, an event over the weekend, like baby showers or whatever, or, um, they're winding down from the week and they actually like remember to pick up their subscription <laughs> then. So yeah, <laughs> it's that piece of like, well, what are we doing with the flowers they're producing? And we have two really big, um, you know, like, well, one really big focus with that and not sharing them freely in our community mm -hmm. um, everybody has like we each have different responsibilities and privileges with what we have and different needs for what we need our land and our farms to do and we have the privilege of not needing to live off the income of our farm and that always feels such like a weird vulnerable thing to say um but it, that's that's our reality and that that's a privilege and luxury mm -hmm. and so the question has always been what are we doing with what we have and so that's why really the largest portion of what we grow on the farm gets gifted back in our community um and the, and including the sales from our dahlia tubers we'll talk more about the growing kindness Great. project yeah but, you know the, last year we donated 100 percent of the sales from the dahlia tubers to the growing kindness project um, and then this year, 50% of the sales to the Growing Kindness Project. And in terms of what we're doing with our flowers and our subscription sales, my goal this year was to sell enough subscriptions that I was able to afford um, help to come in twice a week with weeding and harvesting. And so it really like... It That's was so a, smart. It was just a great way for us to be able to keep doing the thing that we love, which is gifting flowers freely in our community, but also to have to take off some of that pressure and hustle to maintain this all like just I have the sweetest high school gal she's a Mentor Kids 4-H club absolutely a gem and she comes twice a week for four mornings a week and helps with weeding and harvesting and it just it's just enough the size and scale that we are to keep it above water or to give me the room to breathe to say okay I've got to run the kids to you know bike room lessons this morning can you work on harvest while I go and do that right so, Sorry. Right. That's okay. So it's be, uh, I so, think it makes it, um, you figured out how to make this model sustainable. Yeah. And um, and I would love to, we're, we're almost done. We can sit down and, and talk a little bit about yeah. uh, what, what started our conversation a couple of months ago when we talked by phone about the Growing Kindness Project and um, just how that's been a beautiful surprise for you. Absolutely. That you started with something that was very personal and it 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 caught on with others. Mm -hmm. And you're so you found a way for others to be participate and not have to kind of reinvent the wheel for their own communities. So Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm excited to to dig into that conversation. Great. It all ties together so much. Like I said, I think it really um, honestly the biggest part and again it feels like a real like um, 
don't know. I don't, I scary in a way, you know, vulnerability to say what the purpose of our farm is. And yet I wish that I was braver in that because I think it creates, um, more reality and authenticity in what we're doing when we all can like share our purpose and our why. Right. And our whys all look so different, you know, in flower farming, like, there are lots of people who are putting food on the table with their farm or they're paying for their kids' college or they're, you know, saving up for that Europe vacation that they always wanted to take or all those things. And those are all real and meaningful whys. But I think also there's a lot of us in flower farming, if we're all being really real and honest, which feels scary and hard to do, that this is something that we love that brings us joy and we're trying to figure out what our why is in it and i think that that's totally fine but it feels scary when there's so much comparison happening Mm -hmm. and so much um expectation on how we could or should be doing things right um to just kind of rip that band-aid off and say like all of our whys are going to look really different and it doesn't invalidate what we're doing it actually authenticates it yeah so i love that and even just, um, you know, I'm just realizing by asking you how you charge, I, I'm a, putting a set of expectations on like a monochromatic flower farm. Like, of course, everybody has, you know, their their finances figured out and it's to make money. And so I take, I, I, I apologize for that because no, I feel like no, you... No, I think it's, no, I think it's, an, it's, I think it's a great, like, conversation. Like, this is so much of that conversation you and I were having of like, how do we create some transparency around that um, that it's okay to do this for reasons other than being profitable and that said coming back to that how to create how do you create like safety around um, and conversation around like what does that look like how do we honor those who are doing this and need to be making a profit on it how do we make sure that what our why is and what we're bringing to the table and how we're doing it isn't taking away from another person's why. Yeah. And so I think a really big part of that, like you and I have talked about, is really deciding and being honest with ourselves if our intentions to be profitable um, or if our intention is that this is a hobby and we love it than pricing things accordingly. And we're in this kind of weird limbo stage right now. Like it's a little bit of both Mm -hmm. really the farm supports the growing kindness project like that's why right now i need it to be financially sustainable that's why the dahlia sales have mattered um but oh we have new brand new baby goats too i hear them and loud (laughs) (laughs) um but just you know peeling back that layer of if we can be really honest with ourselves and our intention and our whys and what we need to get back from it it makes it a lot easier to move into pricing models that reflect that with integrity for both our what we're doing and for other people and what they're doing so i think one of the really you know i think there's a lot of fear about giving away product like if we give it away it's going to be devalued and I think what lies in that actually that's more fearful in the industry to me is that when we are selling it like at a really discounted price because it's a hobby or because our why is to just make enough to uh, be able to give back in our community or something. Like our pricing model does still need to reflect if we're, if we're going to be selling. Hopefully this is a big topic. For me, so I'm <laughs> yeah. like kind of spinning. I'm following you. <laughs> I'm glad you are because I can go in a rabbit trail. So thanks for your grace for this. Um, If we're going to sell, our pricing needs to be competitive so that it's honoring those who are making a living off of this. I thought that's where you were going with it. And I think that 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 shows your, um, I guess, just your integrity and intentionality about the larger community of your peers. Um, When you sell your tubers, for example, you're selling them at the rate that other area farms Um, are selling them. Absolutely. And, and the fact that you're choosing to use the proceeds to fund your nonprofit is part of your story. Yes. And, and it, you know, it maybe makes people more interested in buying because they know the money's going to help the community in a different way. Yeah. But it's also for people who just love tubers and yes. want to just yep. grow the same varieties yep. you have. And like you said, for our peers, like protecting those, I mean, I have many, many, I'm so, I mean, 
I it's like preaching to the choir. Like the flower community is filled with the most amazing, big hearted, generous, thoughtful people. And I have many friends who work really hard to put food on their table and to get their kids through college and to help, you know, finance their mortgage. And I want to make sure that I have clarity and me having clarity in what I'm doing in the way that I do price the things that I sell. Um, I think that creates respect for what they're doing. Yeah. And then it also creates freedom to be able to say, you know, my why is to give back in my community. So I can freely give and that's, that's not going to devalue their product when I am freely giving, you know, to organizations and individuals in need that's not diminishing the value of their product. It's adding to it because it's drawing attention to, you know, the beauty and importance of local flowers. Yeah. But yeah. That's a good point. This is a, I've been a topic that I have been just kind of getting <laughs> with, spending on, considering, pondering for a long time. And so to find the Growing Kindness Project, uh, or is it called the just Growing Kindness? Um, the Growing Kindness Project. Um, so what happened in all that, in all of my floundering and trying to figure out what it was that I was doing with this farm and all the mistakes I made and some of the, actually the best things that have happened in the last five years have come from what felt like really big crash and burns. Mm. Um, some of the best things have come from big crash and burns in my first year, just in a series of mistakes and misunderstandings. I did not have anything to plant the first year here on this farm, I should say, not the first year ever growing things. And I had pre-sold subscriptions, which is a really wise thing to do. Oh, you're a first year market farmer. You should buy sell the subscriptions first and then figure out how to grow the flowers. So, but that's what had happened. So that's where we're at. And so I so you felt obligated to, to fulfill those oh, orders. Absolutely. Yeah. So I panicked. And at that point, because I hadn't started seeds because I was holding them for these dahlias that I thought I was going to be getting. So I um, panicked and started asking around and just scrapped together every like dahlia tuber cell I could find. It was late in the spring. Um, and uh, I don't know if you remember um, Janelle McCracken. She was a flower farmer here in Stanwood. She retired a few years ago when she retired. She sold me all of her, happened to be that spring, and she sold me all of her dahlia crops or tuber stock. So just, you know, scrapped together. And then kind of accidentally, I ended up with 500 dahlias. Like, you know, that like panic mode. Overbuy. Yep, yep. So then here we go. We have 500 dahlias. Well, of course, there was no way I could, I, I had no idea that I was going to be producing that many flowers that first season. So we had always, um, it was really important to me that our boys knew how to interact in our community in ways that were meaningful. So this became a bit of a family project then, right, Deanna? Yeah, it really started out as a family project. So it was important for me that our kids got out in the community and flowers just became this really easy catalyst to be able to do it. I wanted them to go in and visit elderly people in long-term care homes, but to just walk in empty-handed felt like a lot. So we had in the past, before we bought this farm at year five, had gone and taken flowers from you know our first little flower farm on our one acre um, to long-term care. And it was this beautiful opportunity. Just, it literally opened doors and hearts. You know, people, when they knew you were coming to give flowers, felt safe and welcoming. And so we could make those connections. Well, when we moved here and planted those flower dahlias, was swimming in flowers that first year. And so it was either compost them or do something meaningful with them. And so we would load up with a radio fire wagon that at some point the handle had gotten broken off of. So we had baling twine, like not even cute baling twine, like orange baling twine <laughs> with a squeaky wheel. We'd just fill the buckets because at that point, again, it was that just, just go, just start where you are. I didn't have time to make bouquets. I didn't have the manpower. So we would just take the buckets right from the field harvest, plunk them in the red fire wagon and tow it into long-term care. And the kids would stand with me and pick out flowers we would go through at dinner time, which there was four o'clock. And it was the most joyful, incredible experience. And in that experience, something happened that made me realize that that kindness given um, has this really tremendous ripple effect. So not only, we always, I always walked out of there feeling like I had taken something. Like it felt like such a gift to me. It just was so 
fulfilling. And the kids, you know, they just glowed. Like it was, they felt so proud of what they'd done. And it was hard. I have very shy, quiet kids. So it's definitely was a nudge out of their comfort zone, but they felt so good about those connections. And what happened was, is I realized we were feeling, walking away feeling absolutely filled by it. Those that we'd given flowers to were just so grateful and joyful. And people would come up who'd observe. So, you know, cafeteria staff or parent, people who are visiting their elderly parents and thank us and say, that was just made my day. That just made my day. Um, just to see and observe. And so that's where I got brave enough to realize that, you know, Kindness has a ripple effect and there's joy in the story as well. And so I put out on social media and just shared some little snippets of the boys sharing flowers. And I was really surprised by how many people reached back and said, thank you for sharing that. I was inspired. I went and shared flowers with my elderly, you know, long-term care residents, or I, you know, took flowers to, you know, wherever. And so that kind of just sat with me that later season, you know, here we don't really hit peak season till late fall and then everything dies and then it's school and it's busy. But it was that winter we were, I was standing in the barn dividing hundreds because of course too, I didn't realize they were actually all gonna live and make it and we were gonna have hundreds and hundreds of Dahlia tubers. And realizing that that question that people had been asking me, how can I do this too? Like, how can I replicate what you're doing? Like the key to it was the dye tubers that I was holding, that we could give those freely and share them and encourage and invite other people in to do what we were doing. So we could only go so far with the little red wagon and the three, my three little boys, you know, my husband works, you know, regular nine to five jobs. So slaves on the farm, but it wasn't like something he could even jump in and support during the day. And so, um, so we realized, you know, the key in this is not to hold it tight, but like to let it go and invite other people into it and to use what we have and give it freely to invite others into join wow. us. So we opened up our farm and said anyone who wanted to pick up Dahlia tubers, as long as they promised they would share flowers at some point in their community, um, could come and get Dahlia tubers. And then we had over 100 people show up at the farm and they were so excited. And then, then as we were sharing that on social media... The question was like, could you just tell me, you know, more about it? What do I do with the Dahlia? And then the question started coming. What do we do with the Dahlia tubers? What do I do now? How do I, how do I dig it up and fall? So we realized that it was one thing to give people with an actual supply, but it was kind of like, um, that kind of left them still needing more. It's and like so, that if you teach a man to fish, he will eat kind of thing. Like they had the tubers, but they weren't necessarily flower farmers. Right. So these are just home gardeners. Wow. They just were inspired to want to give and share flowers. And so from that, over the last four years, the Growing Kindness Project has evolved and grown. And we are now a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which feels like such a thrill and joy and terror to say. I mean, we're, it's, we're, we have really big goals and dreams for being able to support people and doing this very thing. You know, flowers are, there is a universal language to flowers. And I jokingly will say that if you walk into a room with three things, people will instantly warm to you. And one is a baby, the other is a puppy, and the other is flowers. And babies and puppies are a lot harder to come by, but we all can grow flowers. And there's just this instant softening that even the most tough, hardened, closed off people will open. And it, it just, it really was about the flowers being the tool and the catalyst for connection in our communities. You know, they, they, were the, they were a gift too, but the real gift was like creating this open door for a moment of real meaningful connection. Yeah, human connection. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's amazing. So, so um, right now, as a 501c3, are you, is most of your energy just helping equip other people who want to grow flowers to s sort of establish some kind of program in their yeah, community? Yeah, it has been um, big growing pains in good ways, you know, in really good ways this last year. The project... The response has been just overwhelming. Um, and, you know, at first it's this thought of like, well, giving flowers to people, that's that's as old as flowers themselves. That's not that's not novel or new or it's not something that's not being done. Like why form an organization around it? Why form a team around it? And the thing that we realize is that, number one, I think we all love accountability. 
Um, and it creates this really great level of accountability when you're a part of somebody, when you have a really clear and meaningful intention of this thing that you're going to do, it supports you and creates accountability. Number two, I think that people really, um, we, we love to do things in community community and like really that's what the heart the whole heart of this project is community and so it's like creating a community around these like-minded people who are really um just really big hearts and want to serve in their communities and so kind of pulling them together and putting this like mastermind of master hearts of people mm. who really mm-hmm. just have a passion for reaching out in their communities and then like kind of the third leg of that is is providing some of that education and support and I definitely do not feel equipped to be the sage on the stage when it comes to that. And, you know, at first I could offer some very basic, you know, gardening um, instruction and how to on growing dahlia tubers, but I don't consider myself a very, you know, we grow on a pretty small scale and I am not a plant. started reaching out and asking other people hey could you share your knowledge on this topic with this team and support them in this and so we've had this incredible team of contributors who are flower farmers and floral designers from all across the united states who have offered their time and and expertise to help educate the team so it's been about just creating support in terms of like education and how to and then creating community around like this team and this shared vision and heart. There's sort of this internal uh, connection in, with people who are on the team mm-hmm. and then the external connection that they each, that's that ripple effect mm-hmm. you talked about. Yep. Uh, but it's more meaningful because they feel more confident with their skill set or their knowledge. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Or just encouragement. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's been, you know, the, the part of the team and community we have, we built, are building out the project to have that be really that it's about that not one day and just like in life we all have something so beautiful to offer when we just bring what we have you know it's kind of like this potluck of skills and talents and so we have one of the things I've been just loving this season is we have people who are in our project who are brand new backyard gardeners who are doing takeovers you know during the week and just sharing and they have all these just little nuggets of absolute treasure and big wisdom that they've learned on their journey so far that they're sharing with the team or also that just normalization of like oh good you know I'm not the only one who's battling weeds too um and then we have people in the project for flower farmers you know are jumping on and sharing you know like they're more in-depth experience with something um and so it's just like this really beautiful blending of when everybody just shares what they have um and we all you know walk away from it so filled so in four years, um, how has this mushroomed? How, how do you measure it? Is it by the number of team members or the number of stems given away? Yeah. Or do you even know? Yeah, so that's a really great question. As we get legs under the project as a 501c and start to figure out all of these pieces, because that was the real uh, awakening, an awakening realization for me over the last few years. Because at first, I really... Uh, Anne Frank says no one ever becomes poor by giving. And I really do believe that in my heart of hearts. But the reality became really quickly that if I gave everything from our farm, every penny of profit, every stem of flowers, I still couldn't keep up with how big the project had grown and how quickly it had grown. And so we really started to look at what would be more sustainable for the long term of the project. And that's why we went to having options for membership. And Mm -hmm. so... Um, anyone can join at any point. That's our gardener role. And that's absolutely free of charge with you know, access to resources and support and connection. And then to tap into even higher level of training and education and materials, then that's a paid membership. And what that did this year was it created some breathing room for the project to be able to sustain itself this year. And of course, our long-term goal is like, we would love to, you know, have a grant writer working with us and to really be able to reach out um, in fundraising capacities in ways that we can support um, even more people with resources and education to get out in their communities and grow and give flowers. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm so excited to hear more about it. And I know you've got your own website for Growing Kindness Project and lots of 
extra information and details. So we'll be sure to share all that yeah, yeah, uh, with love the viewers. If anyone, if this is resonating on any in any way, jump in. We want you. We want you to join us. That's the thing. You know, it's that I get. I get questions sometimes. Like, why? Well, you know, I've never grown flowers. Like, perfect. You know, we say if you've got a little bit of dirt in a big heart, you have what it takes to grow kindness in your community. It really is about just jumping in, starting where you are. And then the other question I get is, well, I'm a flower farmer. I can't give away all my product for free. And that's an absolute valid concern. So we just really encourage that if you're a flower farmer and you become a member of the project, just make it clear, you know, that piece like you and I were talking about, like what's freely given is truly freely given. And what you sell that supports your farm and your family, like that's that's your income, that's your mm -hmm. livelihood. Mm -hmm. But it's okay to give give freely alongside of that or in in addition to that right or if you have a particular mission or cause you articulate that to your customers so they they know there's these you know this other part of your business that right. is community based right. yep and so one of the things that we did actually you know those tiny little things that are a small detail but they actually help a lot was we created gift tags for bouquets and they say growing kindness these flowers are grown and shared with the hope that they brighten your day. Like, mm -hmm. No strings attached, you know, and really, the kids and I learned really quickly, and this has been something we really encourage our team in, is that we have to be clear in our intentions with people. Kindness freely given is not, it's not, it doesn't feel normal to us anymore. We always, as, as a culture, I think we have the sense of jadedness of, what string is attached here? Right. What's, like, your, what's angle? your angle? Yeah. What's your angle? Yeah. I agree. And up. so, the first time when we were in long-term care, it took me a little, t a little while to figure out. So Eli, our oldest, would you know hop, take off with his flower bouquet, and he would, you know, go to a table to give it, and then he would come back with it. And I said, "Well, you, you know, aren't you going to give it to them?" And he said, "They said they don't have their wallet." And he was so little, he didn't recognize that that meant they thought he was charging. And so I really quickly had to equip them with the language that I grew these on my farm, on our farm, and I want to give them to you. These are for you. Um, and really quickly clarifying, there was no strings attached. They were freely given. And so, yeah, there we have those bouquet tags are available for download um, on the website. You know, there's all kinds of just little little things like that that we've learned along the way. Um, That's awesome. Make it clear in your community and with you know if you're a flower farmer, you know with your clients, you know what what your intention is in these really gifted flowers. Mm. I love that. I love what you've picked too. Thank you. I should grab a few more things. This is a hodgepodge <laughs> for sure. Oh, it's great. And um, if you have time to make a bouquet, we'd love to see it. But if you don't, we'll uh, take a picture of it later on. Okay, sounds great. I'm gonna grab a few more things really quickly. We can help head up and do that. Mm. So have you been able to have people on the farm this year or um, are, is it sort of coming out of COVID? You've just it's, put, put that really, on hold. We really held off until the state opened officially to schedule anything. And to be honest, you know, like, again, like that full vulnerability, just like, let's show up where we are. This year has been overwhelming for me um, in, in getting this project off the ground and the the groundwork and the behind the scenes and the pieces. And so it's really been about learning my limitations um, and holding space for my family as yeah. well. Taking and a pause on all those uh, events. We have really put a big pause this summer. We will probably still have one two things this year but very minimal um and, and that's okay you know i've really learning to lean into that like pausing or stopping doesn't mean you're quitting there's a difference um and really just recognizing that it's okay to say wait sometimes so we're kind of in a, in a waiting season on the pieces that normally happen on the farm so. mm -hmm. but it's it's created space to really um to build this and grow this which is and Deanna, will you do a Dahlia sale this fall or Dahlia tuber sale or? Um, um, we always have ours in the spring. Oh, um, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, it, for us, it's it's just logistically what I can manage. Um, so it gives me an opportunity to get the Dahlia stuff um, dug and divided and inventoried. So typically we go a little bit later spring. We're usually like um, March 
into April um, when we kick ours off. So yeah, and we're working on looking at what that looks like this next year since so much of our um, proceeds from the sale go to the project and hosting that in a way that feels really good for customers. Our right. Dahlia Tuber sale was 90% sold out in 20 minutes this year, which... Was, Say that again. I can't even believe that. It was 90% sold out in 20 minutes. Wow. It wasn't even really... I mean, it was insane. We, you know, sat there and watched the inventory just fly out the door. So we were down to... In 20 minutes, all that was left was the red price. <laughs> and were you doing this on like a Squarespace or? Yeah, hosted off of our, um, we use, um, yeah, Squarespace is our website host. Yeah, so, yep. so they have a store and that yep. kind of thing, yeah. Yep, yep, so just simple. The, the challenge is, is that um, the demand is so tremendously great for Dahlia's right now, or Dahlia tubers. Um, and a lot of the supply is coming from small farms. But as a like culture, we're so used to online sales now and them functioning in a certain way that we have found that we have to be really, really intentional in educating people that come to the sale, which is wonderful when they're those who followed our farm or the project for years and they understand, you know, like that's that piece of like, tell your story, be the face of your business, because then people understand it's a real person a real family behind it because we don't have it's not a big enough sale to afford a big fancy e-commerce platform right and you can't hit uh, volumes of any single variety either probably right right and so you know we we really really educate people going into that and um, you know for the most part people are really gracious and understanding when it sold out so quickly or stock they had hoped to get wasn't available but it um it was really easy for us to see in the responses the, the, the people who are were, that are really comfortable with the sales platform that functions in a certain way and didn't know the story of this being a family farm and their responses and disappointment to it being sold out really quickly versus those who really support us as a family farm and were purchasing because they wanted dahlias but also knowing they were supporting the family farm. It was very different yeah. Um, yeah. engagement and response to the sale. Yeah. Well, all that said, we are looking at formatting the sale differently next year to hopefully make sure it's a more enjoyable experience <laughs> for everybody. It's um, just, it's like growing kindness has growing pains. Yes, yes, truly. Oh, that's so, beautiful. Thank you. Why don't you stop and I'll get a nice shot of you holding them because I think we're running out of battery. So I think we're going to stop. Talk too much. No, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been such a great morning. That was wonderful. I am so grateful for you joining me today and meeting Deanna and learning more about what she's doing with Gr Growing Kindness Project. I know I mentioned early in the interview that we were going to sit down and talk further about growing the Growing Kindness Project, but honestly, we were having such a great flow of conversation. I didn't want to interrupt it, and we just went until the battery died. Thanks so much for joining us today. Keep an eye out soon for details about a special Growing Kindness project taking place in August, hosted by Holly Chapel at Hope Flower Farm in Leesburg, Virginia, along with Growing Kindness Project's ambassadors, Sarah Dakin and Tom Precht of Maryland-based Grateful Gardeners. As soon as I have those details, I'll share them in a future episode. You can also subscribe to updates at the Growing Kindness Project's website, growingkindnessproject.org. And I'm so glad that Deanna Kitchen and Twig and Vine is part of the Slow Flowers community. I need to share some sponsor thank yous before we wrap up. Thank you to our lead sponsor for 2021, Farm Grow Flowers. Farm Grow Flowers delivers iconic burlap wrap bouquets and lush abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting more than 20 U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $9 million of U.S. grown fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually. Discover more at farmgirlflowers.com. Our next sponsor thank you goes to the Gardener's Workshop, which offers a full curriculum of online education for flower farmers and farmer florists. Online education is more important than ever, and you'll want to check out the course offerings at thegardenersworkshop.com. 
Thank you to Rody. Rody is a same day delivery platform that connects you and your flower deliveries with drivers already heading in the right direction. Learn more at rody.com. And thank you to flowerfarm.com. Flower Farm is a leading wholesale flower distributor that sources from carefully selected flower farms to offer high performing fresh flowers sent directly from the farm straight to you. Find flowers and foliage from California, Florida, Oregon, and Washington by using the Origin Selection Tool in your search. It's smarter sourcing. Learn more at flowerfarm.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. As our movement gains more supporters and more passionate participants who believe in the importance of our domestic cut flower industry, the momentum is contagious. I know you feel it too. I value your support and invite you to show your thanks to support Slow Flower's ongoing advocacy, education, and outreach activities. You can find the donate button in the column to the right at deborahprinzing.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing host and producer of the Slow Flowers Show. Next week, you're invited to join me in putting more Slow Flowers on the table, one stem at a time. The content and opinions, opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. The Slow Flowers podcast is engineered and edited by Andrew Brenlin. Thank you so much to Andrew for helping me set up our new video podcast called The Vodcast at The Slow Flower Show and for teaching me the technology. And I want you to learn more about Andrew at soundbodymovement.com. Thanks so much and I'll see you next week.